Great. So I want to spend a few minutes with you this afternoon talking about how Nimbus, as the granddaddy of learning how to take measurements of precipitation and how far we've gone in the 40 years since Nimbus started doing precipitation measurements from space. So um, I will start by going to the next slide. So I have a little bit of an outline here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the Nimbus um, measurements and instrument launches um, for that data. Um, I'll explain in as layman terms as I can how these radiometers work to measure precipitation. And then I'm going to talk about some of the science results that have happened in terms of precipitation um, from Nimbus all the way through the decades to the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, uh, which I'm the project scientist of, and we launched in uh, February. And I'll show you some of that data as well. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that. All right, so a little bit of a launch history here. Um, so there were these, con and you probably already talked about this. I'm sorry, I had to sneak out for another important event in the middle of the afternoon. Um, but here's some of the history here. Um, really, the scanning microwave spectrometer uh, scans was the beginning of taking measurements of precipitation from space. Before then, they weren't really looking at that type of, of data. And then so over the years, you know, microwave sounding units have been launched. Um, in 1997, the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission was launched, um, which the whole focus was on precipitation. It had a radar uh, built by the Japanese. Um, AMSUs, uh, ATMS um, have come out of this. And then, as we just said, the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission uh, was just launched. And it has uh, great capabilities to be able to measure um, rain and snow um, from space. All right, so this is the SCAMS instrument. Some of the things I want to point out here, 110-kilometer um, footprint. That's gigantic. Think about trying to resolve a convective core, a, a, a thunderstorm of the summer in 110 kilometers. It's going to be completely washed out. So yes, this was good, and it got data, but it was uh, pretty big. It also had this, set of, this series of channels. And 31 uh, gigahertz was basically the only channel that was sensitive to precipitation. Um, the falling part of precipitation. The 22 was uh, sensitive to precip or water vapor in the atmosphere, but it really didn't see the precipitating stuff. The other channels were just for temperature at different altitudes, so this would typically see around 4 kilometers, 11 kilometers, and 18 kilometers, these different channels here. Okay, so the next slide uh, is GPM. So GPM launched just this year, has um, 13 channels. Um, V and H, is, that's two channels each. So we have 13 channels. We go from 10 gigahertz, which is sensitive to very heavy rain rates, up to 110 millimeters an hour. Um, and then we go all the way down to 183 gigahertz, which is sensitive to the falling snow and down to 0.2 millimeters an hour. So we have a range from 0.2 millimeters an hour all the way up to 110. And then we also are able to detect and estimate falling snow with this device. We also have the uh, dual frequency precipitation radar, which has two frequencies, KU, which is about 35 gigahertz, no, uh, uh, 13 gigahertz, and then KA, which is 35 gigahertz. And really, what the other thing I want to point out is we get down to five kilometer footprints. So now you can start seeing those little pop-up storms that hit one part of your neighborhood, but not another, you know, where you drive through, it's raining, and then it's dry. Um, so this, at that resolution, we can start seeing the regional uh, scale um, uh, cloud um, effects. Now, there's some parts of our scientific community that want us down at one kilometer or less, so you can get at more detail at the processes. But this is pretty good. Um, so I've already talked about the 0.2 to 110 millimeters an hour in snow. Uh, let me talk a little bit more about here. It was designed for a three-year life. Um, it, five years of fuel was put on it. But based on our projections, we might last uh, 10 to 15 years. Now, TRIM, launched in 1997, has just run out of fuel. So 90, or like 16 or 17 years. And we hope to last at least that long. But you don't know with the solar cycles. The solar cycles cause drag, and it pulls the spacecraft down. So you need fuel to boost it back up to keep it at its, its altitude. All right. Um, 
The other really cool thing about this is this instrument, the radiometer. Um, when I talk to high school students, middle school students, the radiometer is like taking an x-ray through the clouds. So you see um, where there's lots of rain and lots of ice with this radiometer. With the radar that the Japanese provided, you get layer by layer information about the particles within the cloud. And I like to describe that kind of as a CAT scan. And just like doctors use CAT scans and x-rays to understand what's happening within the human body and diagnose what's going on, we use our information to understand the layers and levels within the cloud. And we can use that information then to improve weather forecasting models and climate change models because those models have fairly simplistic representations of precipitating particles within the cloud. All right. OK, so how do passive microwave uh, radiometers work? I'm not going to talk about the radar, the CAT scan one. I don't have enough time to talk about that. But let's talk about the passive radiometers, because Nimbus really uh, started this passive device thing here. So really what they are, they're instruments that they see everything in their field of view, all the way down to the surface. And if, if you got the right frequency, you can also see um, into the soil a little bit. Um, so what happens with ice is you tend to get scattering. So cosmic background comes down, there's ice particles, they scatter, reflects back up to the spacecraft, and you see a cooling in your brightness temperatures. That's the measurement there. Rain can cause scattering, which causes the cooling, but it also has emission and absorption, which would cause a warming. So if you're looking at an ocean, the ocean is really cold background, very reflective of the cosmic background. Um, and then you get a cloud over it, you see a, a big spike of warming in the brightness temperatures. So that's how you can tell you've got a cloud. And the, the temperatures change based on whether there's rain or if it's just liquid. The surface also contributes. You can have scattering from, say, snow packs, uh, or you can have emission and absorption from you know, asphalt or um, trees, uh, warmer bodies like that. And so all of that contributes to the brightness temperature. So what do you get? So this is some work I did probably uh, uh, 15 years ago. And what this plot is, and I'm hopefully kind of make this simple, is so I had a convective rainstorm. And uh, so in the, the solid line there. So this is frequency from 10 gigahertz to 1,000 gigahertz. Um, and then this is the brightness temperature value. And so like this is a convective rain in solid. Precipitating snow is in this dotted line right here. And then anvil cloud, so it's an anvil cloud, no precipitation falling out, is in this dashed line. And then a shorter dashed line is high relative humidity and then low relative humidity with the dot dash. So you can see that if you're here in this you know, 180 or so gigahertz range, you can see distinct patterns for all of these different um, uh, cloud conditions. But where you're down here, there's really only two distinct patterns. Um, the rain or all the other cases. So the idea is to try to get the channels that are sensitive that give you the most degrees of freedom. So SCAMS had these channels. I already mentioned the channels before. So you can see that we're you know, sensitive to high relative humidity. So now you know you've got cloud water. Sensitive to um, the, the rain, which is the solid thing here. And then this is kind of a, all the other pieces. So you could kind of learn a little bit of information. And then you could use additional separation between this one and this one to get at the rain in the cloud. I mean, the rain, yeah, the rain in the cloud. And then this provided additional information at, at um, the, the 30, 37. No, these were the, the, the uh, temperature sounding channels. So they're not, you see them all coming together right here. So you're not getting much information at all about the rain. That's all about. Those, those channels are for um, temperature sounding. All right. So typical precipitation radiometers today have channels from 10 through uh, 89 gigahertz. And you can see here, when you add the 10, you get this very heavy rain. Um, when you add the 90 gigahertz, you get a lot more separation there. So you're basically getting two or three more degrees of freedom for being able to distinguish between convective rain, falling snow, high relative humidity, low relative humidity, uh, and things like that. So the GPM radiometer actually added three, uh, well, it added these additional frequencies um, up here. Um, at uh, 166, 183, uh, plus or minus 3 and plus or minus 7. So we're getting a lot more information, and that allows us to resolve between these different characteristics. 
We don't have any radiometers way up here yet. There are instruments that have those channels, um, but not designed for this. All right, so let's go back to the science. This is a science team meeting for the, the uh, SCAMS instrument in 1990, uh, 1977. Anybody in this room in this picture? Just one? All right. I'm going to shake your hand. You're, you're, you're right here. Yeah. OK. You want to stand up and see how you changed over the years? Love the hairstyles. Love the hairstyles. I hope that uh, there's no pictures of me that are floating around in about 40 years. <laughs> but no, this is great. This, this is a great science team. I, you know, these names here I've seen in papers my whole life. Um, you know, key papers for precipitation science. So this is great. Um, and this is some of the data that they, they came up with. This is the cover of Science in 1977, where they were able to do the first global Im images of the water vapor. They separated water vapor from cloud liquid water. And so this is the, the results that they got, and good enough to get on the, the cover of Science at that time. But the, the lead um, author was uh, Dave Stalin, who actually happens to be my grand advisor. Does that make sense? One of his graduate students was my advisor. So <laughs> I'm related to this work, right? <laughs> and unfortunately, he passed away several years ago. Um, anyway, uh, so now here's the trim and GPM science team. We're massive. We had uh, almost 200 people at our last science team meeting. Um, we have international representation. We had um, about 16 people from Japan coming. They are a partner, so they do work carefully with us. But we had 12 other um, countries represented at this science team meeting. And the reason is, is because we can't rest on just measuring precipitation in the US or Japan. Precipitation is a global phenomenon. And we really need to know where it's precipitating how is that precipitating changing during climate change or, or, or uh, other patterns? We need to know it both globally. We need to know it at the local scale, at that five kilometer scale. Uh, and we need to know it frequently. And so one of the great things about GPM is that we um, design the instrument so carefully that we're using it to basically intercalibrate all the other precipitation sensors out there. NOAA's given us data. International um, satellites are giving us data. And we will have rain rate estimates everywhere in the world every three hours. And as you can imagine, that's great for applications, you know, for predicting floods, for landslides, for improving our, our climate models and our um, uh, precipitation uh, models. So, all right. And I'll just note that um, Arthur Howe, Dr. Arthur Howe, who was the project scientist for this mission, uh, passed away about 11 months ago. And uh, we also had a very nice um, memorial symposium for him at that time. So what have we learned from TRIM? So this is TRIM, this is climatology, millimeters per day. It's averaged over a whole year, over uh, about uh, 11, nine years of data. So you can see these patterns. Heavy precipitation um, just north of the equator and the oceans and a little bit down here. You know, so, and then this is the standard deviation among all the inputs. So you can see that, well, maybe there's some problems measuring our rain here, maybe a little bit in there. There's some issues with the ways, the different ways of um, developing this data. And then Bob Adler uh, put this data set together. Another interesting thing is, OK, we know that El Nino and La Nina, typically they uh, measure that index based on the sea surface temperature and how that changes. With the long record of trim, they actually can uh, use an index of precipitation to see how, where the, when the precipitation starts to change, you can actually tie that to El Nino and La Nina. So, um, so the red here is basically indicating an El Nino effect, and the blue is La Nina. And so what you can see here is uh, basically when the precipitation, and, and then, OK, so this is cut off, but this is a plus one and a minus one. Once you get above, a, and, and so these are averages over precipitation. Let me calm down. All right, so the average over precipitation over this long time period from uh, 79 through 2014, this is using GPCP data, which goes back and forth in time, goes back in time as early as data as we got. 
And then, so this is an average over all that time, and that's the zero line here. And so th these precipitation changes, if it's one standard deviation above or one standard deviation below, you can start telling what's happening. So in El Nino, we, have, we tend to have more precipitation. And these are boxes in the El Nino, La Nina region, so it's not global. It's just a focused area. So what you see is then you have an increase here and a very low decrease in precipitation. Uh, so this basically says there's no La Nina. We've got an El Nino. And so you can kind of see the up and down going back and forth between uh, precipitation and um, the El Nino and La Nina. So this is just a different way to look at um, predicting um, El Nino and La Nina. All right. So from trim to GPM, trim was launched in 97, as I said. Uh, it just recently ran out of fuel. The summer it ran out of fuel. Um, it'll probably last into the spring, maybe summer, um, before um, we have to turn off all the instruments. We can actually still take data, even though it's slowly descending. Um, trim has shown the uh, importance of having data for predicting floods and landslides and other things like that. And we know that those operational users are already taking in GPM data for that. Um, I've already talked mostly about um, this information. But one of the really interesting things is because TRIM had um, operational users, GPM made it a requirement to get the data out to the public as soon as possible. So one to three hours after <coughs> an event, the data is on our websites, freely available to anybody that wants to get it. And that's really great if you're a, you know, emergency management planner, and you know that the last nine hours ago you had three inches an hour of rain, and six hours ago it was four inches an hour of rain, and now it's two inches and you've got a flooding basin, you can say, let's get our people out of here, you know, let's evacuate. Um, and this can also be used by, um, for hurricanes as well. So um, the other thing to point out is trim only went from plus or minus 35 degrees latitude GPM goes higher, so we can actually track things like Hurricane Sandy um, and look at it as it goes into the um, extra tropics and mid-latitudes. So um, this, is, this is really great for the state of the science in terms of uh, uh, precipitation. So this is um, an event, the March 17 um, snowstorm that was here in D.C., and if you were in the area, um, they shut down a lot of things. Uh, Goddard was closed. Um, and this is some of the data that we are able to get. This is actually only about two and a half weeks after we launched. Um, and this is the data. It took us a lot longer to render this data than to actually take it. So off the coast of the Carolinas, you can see this rain event. The reds and the greens are rain. And then over uh, inland, you have this very cold um, falling snow shown in blues. And so you can see the x-ray, that really long strip of data that goes from there to there, that's just projected onto the surface in terms of, of rain, but also the, the CAT scan-like data from the radar. And really interesting things to note, you know, the rain actually has a higher cloud top than the snow. It's a much shallower cloud. Um, you can see that there's a melting layer here. So above the melting layer, you have all your ice, and below it, it's melting and raining. Um, and so this data gives us great insight. And, you know, we can use this stuff to start measuring snowpack information to help us uh, understand our water resources. Many areas of the world do use this um, data. Uh, need, need to know how much is precipitating so that they can monitor their freshwater resources. All right, so I'm already talking about this. So um, I've already talked about flood monitoring, uh, landslide hazard forecast. We can use this in all in models. Um, freshwater management, crop forecasting. So all of these instruments can tell you when it's raining and when it's not raining. If it's not raining, you've got drought conditions, which affects your crop productions. So um, some of the trim data has actually been used to send food to Africa early because they knew that they, would, they were having a drought and they would not be able to produce enough food in time. Other interesting things, where it rains, you get puddles. Where you have puddles, you get mosquitoes. And if you're in some parts of the world, those mosquitoes might have malaria. So we've actually done some really interesting stuff with the trim data. And that's all I have, so. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Oh, two more things. 
The, there's a GPM model over here, so you can actually come up and take a look at the spacecraft. And then the other thing was um, Chuck gave me an email from some of the first people that were working on Nimbus. Um, Garrett Campbell, which I saw in the previous presentation, is one of the names. Um, they have some uh, new, uh, new scientific results um, based on some of the first observations from uh, Nimbus. And this is uh, Dr. Garrett Campbell and David Gallagher. Um, they've recovered the first observations by the Nimbus series of satellites, August uh, 31st, 1964. Um, they've used that image and many more to derive sea ice content in the 1960s around Antarctica. And they're showing very large fluctuations um, uh, around 1964 to 1966. And they published this um, and they um, uh, recently, uh, they published it along with some uh, corroborating uh, information that showed up in the ice core measurements from, that, um, from the Antarctic. So what they're saying is Nimbus data is still being scientifically used and still producing new results. So good, good for the scientists out there. All right, now I'll stop talking.